thank you for being here. Uh, it was good to see so many people who braved the, uh, the weather and the traffic and other things. <clears throat> the, uh, I was going to make some comments, historical comments, about uh, Metsphere and Vista, but I'm mindful of the clock and we're a little late, so I'll defer those. The, the one I would, uh, perhaps worth noting, back in about 1996 when uh, we were poised to launch uh, the implementation of Vista in, in the VA, and Rob Kladner and I were uh, sitting uh, late one night uh, talking about this, and I said, you know, we really, uh, you know, why, why don't you go out and, and start a company uh, that actually takes Vista to the commercial space because it works so much better than anything else that's out there. Well, for whatever reason, that, that didn't happen. Uh, we both pursued other strategies, although uh, not too long. Uh, I've been pleased to have been involved in the genesis of Vista and to, or of uh, Metsphere in 2002 and um, its evolution to the point where we are today. But my assignment is not to talk about that, but to set the stage for some of the speakers who will come later. And my comments are by design somewhat at a uh, high level. And some of this may be uh, not totally new, although there may be some things here uh, that have a little different uh, spin than what uh, you may have heard before. But let me just uh, jump right into this in, in the interest of, of time. You would, uh, you'd have to be like the guy in the, uh, the Geico uh, commercial that's been living under a rock to not uh, understand that healthcare is poised for a uh, profound transformation and, and is facing some uh, very turbulent water in the, uh, the years ahead. Indeed, I uh, think the whitewater metaphor is quite appropriate and the notion that we're entering class five rapids. How many people here have gone whitewater rafting? Or, or Okay, and, and people are familiar with how rapids are graded. You know, from one to, to six with five basically being the only thing that uh, a sane person uh, or the most dangerous that a sane person would go down, continuous rapids, large waves huge rocks, uh, lots of turbulence, requires very precise maneuvering to, uh, to survive. So the real question uh, for hospital administrators, for medical group administrators, and for others in healthcare today is how do we navigate the turbulent waters that are uh, in front of us and, and will be in front of us for some time uh, to come? And so saying that, I think it's important that we uh, we say something about navigation. And so whether you're navigating a river, and I, I suppose it's also a, an appropriate metaphor since we're next to the Hudson, uh, although you'd have to go way up the Hudson to find any uh, whitewater. Uh, but you know, talking about navigation uh, in any setting, it requires a number of things. I mean, basically it's a process of how you get from one place to another uh, in a reasonable way. It requires, first of all, knowing your destination uh, it requires that you can put your position relative to other uh, known locations. Certainly today it involves uh, multiple different techniques that then have to be integrated to, to find and stay on uh, course. And it's also a very dynamic process. It's continually changing because the water is occurring, so uh, you know, other things are, are changing. So with that as uh, the, uh, the context, what I'd like to do in the, the time I have with you here is to do basically three things. I want to do a very quick uh, destination check on where 21st century healthcare uh, is likely to go, or at least over the next decade or so. Say a few things about the three major currents that are driving this. I'm not going to talk a lot about the, uh, the rapids per se, although you have to talk about that to get into what are currents. And you know, the, the nautical folks understand the difference between rapids and, and currents. And then uh, just close with a few highlights of how the uh, electronic health record is an essential uh, navigational aid uh, going forward. So the question is, where's 21st century healthcare going? Uh, you know, what, what's our destination? If we're really going to navigate the rapids, what, what do we need to know about the destination? And let me just very quickly uh, go through some characteristics because, frankly, the, the model isn't clear. Uh, or the models, because it's likely that there will be multiple models uh, that will be at the other end. But we can describe at least some of the predominant characteristics. And I'm going to borrow, frankly, from uh, the crossing the quality chasm, which I think has done a very nice job of, of summarizing the 10 attributes 
or characteristics of where 21st century healthcare is going. You know, it's about systems, uh, systems that are, are designed to provide safe, effective, timely, efficient care, et cetera. It's about changing the relationship to one of a continuous healing relationship instead of one based on visits. I want to come back to that in a moment because that's probably the most disruptive of the, the concepts that are embodied here. Customized according to patient needs. Uh, patients are informed, so they're the source of control. Uh, knowledge shares slowly among, between patients and caregivers, among caregivers, uh, among uh, all the other entities that are uh, involved. Decision making is evidence based. Heaven forbid that we would actually use all the science that is accumulating to make the right decisions about what is done. Safety is an inherent part uh, of the system and that we continually strive to improve it. It's transparent. Patient needs are anticipated. You know, the, one of the things that, that when you've been around this as long as I and Bill and, I, and many of you have and, and you keep hearing, well, our patients are different, uh, gets a little monotonous because frankly, you know, diabetics and uh, hypertensives and other folks, they all have the same biology and yes, there are nuances, but you know, they really aren't that fundamentally different. And the striking thing is how predictable care can be. And if you do this, then that. If you don't do this, then that. Uh, and we can actually anticipate needs and plan accordingly. Uh, no question about how wasteful American uh, health care is at, at this point. And then the, the five C's about care that's characterized by collaboration, coordination, communication, et cetera. So that's, those are the general attributes or characteristics, which I think there's widespread agreement. That's where it's going, albeit the model may be a little uh, fuzzy at the moment. But I just want to harken back to this idea that if we really view care as a continuous healing relationship as opposed to reimbursable visits, that that is a truly disruptive uh, idea. And it requires that we change uh, many of the fundamental concepts that uh, care is based upon. You know, what does access mean when you have a 24-7, 365 relationship with somebody? Whether it's through the internet or social media or some other uh, means and that you're not relying on a face-to-face -face visit. And who's a caregiver? Certainly in, in chronic disease, the primary caregiver is the patient, assisted by a lot of other knowledgeable folks. You know, how do, do we, how do we do consultations when you have this continuous relationship and that whole concept of a consultation changes? You know, what do you pay for? How is the payment model set up if you have a continuous relationship? I mean, th this idea fundamentally changes the, the paradigm and, and the concept here, and, and it's one which I don't think has been internalized as much as uh, within the, uh, the industry as much as it, it will be certainly uh, going forward. So shifting is, what, what are the three major currents that have to be navigated uh, over the next five to, to ten years if, in fact, we're going to end up uh, anywhere close to uh, our destination? And basically, there are the three indicated here. Yeah. The quest for value. This has been what we've been searching for for a long time, although we tend to focus on cost and other things as opposed to the, the root uh, concept of value. The, the demand for greater accountability. And then we have this growing supply-demand mismatch that has to be uh, addressed. So let me just dissect each of those a, a little bit. So, Concept, what is healthcare value? And again, everyone here probably took Econ 101 at some point. You know, value is this basic concept of quality divided by cost. Not terribly challenging as a concept, although it does get a little difficult from a healthcare perspective. And one of my uh, more environmentally oriented friends heard I was coming to New Jersey and so uh, gave me this slide. <laughs> and, and in many ways, it, it kind of makes a point about value uh, in healthcare because it really depends on which lens you're looking through. You know, is it value for the patient and their family? Is it value for employers, for the taxpayer, for other payers, for investors or shareholders? You know, depending on how you view value, you come up with different ways uh, or different things that you may do to operationalize that. And ultimately, that's one of the reasons why we've struggled so much with this uh, concept uh, in healthcare. But let's just go, uh, again, the, uh, talk about the numerator side of this, uh, quality. And again, much of this is not going to be new, but 
uh, perhaps it'll at least keep you occupied for a little time. So what, what does quality mean in, in healthcare? And I probably could show you the same slide, but, but here's another one. The, um, you know, I, I, I've tried to use this with my wife, and, and she says, no, you're just fat. Um, <laughs> you know, it's, again, there, there are different perspectives about how uh, we view uh, quality and, and what it is, uh, what is quality depending on which lens you're looking through and, and who's doing the looking. Now, the Institute of Medicine more than 20 years ago defined quality, and that's a nice definition, although it's, it's frankly not terribly uh, functional. And for those of you who didn't take uh, too much mathematics, I don't want to uh, frighten you, but you know, that basically uh, we have to think about quality as, as a, a functional equation here, where it's a sum of, of many different things. How does the uh, patient or the family perceive it, the service satisfaction, the technical quality, the things that doctors and others uh, think are important, access, whether it's temporal, geographic, or other dimensions of access, functional status, uh, community benefit, uh, and we really have to have metrics in, in all of those domains if we're going to adequately try to describe uh, quality. So one might ask, well, how does, you know, American healthcare do as far as quality? Well, without belaboring stuff that you know, frankly, not, not very good. Uh, what is perhaps surprising is how consistent the literature is in painting the picture you know, Beth McGlynn and, and uh, colleagues did a nice paper in uh, New England Journal a few years ago showing that basically the chance of getting evidence-based care, the right care, was slightly better than tossing a coin. Uh, others have shown, and, and you can read through this as, as well, uh, you know, whether it's in pediatrics, chronic disease, Medicaid, others, that roughly it's just a little bit better than half of folks are getting what the evidence would suggest. Now, in some areas, that's gotten a bit better uh, in recent years, although the numbers still are, are not terribly uh, satisfying. If we compare U.S. healthcare to other countries, again, we find that uh, despite some of the rhetoric about how uh, great the American healthcare system is, and it is in, in some ways, uh, we don't frankly compare all that well with many other uh, countries in the world as far as our performance on efficiency, ensuring uh, everyone has uh, care uh, and a number of other uh, common uh, metrics that are used to uh, look at quality. And then we have this, uh, this other little problem of, of medical errors. Uh, some of you, uh, I don't know if you can read that, this, uh, does this look like aspirin or arsenic to you? I know I've uh, certainly been in that situation. And, and again, uh, any way you, uh, you, you count on it, uh, healthcare is a fairly dangerous activity these days. And using the relatively conservative uh, Institute of Medicine numbers, about 250 Americans die every day uh, because of uh, therapeutic adverse events. And if you use health grades numbers, it's actually uh, quite a bit uh, higher. So, uh, by the way, it, people see the recent uh, health grades report uh, that looked at this, came out just about a week ago or so where there are uh, a couple of the things that were perhaps most notable about that report was that if, and, and they rank hospitals you know, on a five-star system, not altogether unlike where uh, Medicare is going, but if the uh, one-star hospitals performed at the same level as the five-star hospitals, that would have... Uh, ostensibly prevented more than 240,000 deaths in the three years uh, of the Medicare population that they were looking at. This was just for uh, Medicare uh, beneficiaries. And that the likelihood of not coming out of a hospital alive in a one-star hospital versus a five-star hospital uh, was a 73% uh, difference. So, I mean, you know, these are fairly significant uh, differences in, in quality uh, among hospitals. Well, the, the denominator side of, of the value equation is simply cost. And again, I don't need to beat you up with lots of, of numbers about uh, how uh, expensive is uh, American uh, health care, uh, certainly more than uh, whether you look at Per capita spending, uh, total expenditures are part of GDP. Uh, I think this slide is, is particularly telling. If we just go back a little more than 10 years ago and look at the rate of rise of insurance premiums for employer 
employment-based insurance. You know, 150 million Americans get their health care through employment-based insurance. During that time, what we see is that the uh, increase in premiums and what workers are paying for those premiums has increased more than 160 percent, whereas wages have only increased 50 percent and CPI is at 38 percent. The average family is now paying for employment-linked insurance $15,000 a year, which is roughly uh, what you could spend that much uh, for a number of different types of cars uh, that are, will last more than uh, one year. And you see that this difference is growing over time. And you know, the bottom line is this is simply not a sustainable uh, picture in, in the large long term. And despite what uh, the proclivity of saying, well, let's turn it over to the private sector and let private insurance manage it, you know, private insurance rates have been rising about a third more than Medicare uh, spending per patient uh, over this uh, period of time uh, as well. Let me just uh, take a, a moment here to also talk about, and this is particularly relevant as we look to the future and, and, and spending, you know, the, the top 10 reasons why healthcare costs are rising, but the, the caveat or the, the addendum that you have to put that is what can we change in the short term? And starting at the top, population growth and aging, and these aren't necessarily priority ranked, although this one accounts for more than half of the uh, increase in spending. You know, is that going to change in the short term? Not a chance. You know, population's growing, people are aging for at least the, the next 20 plus years. Uncontrolled proliferation of technology. This is America. You know, we like technology. What's the likelihood that we're going to turn off the spigot? You know, it's zero. And, and frankly, there's some incredible stuff in the pipeline at FDA and, and elsewhere that's really going to benefit patient care. But it's going to come with a price tag. You know, increasing chronic care. Again, the, the, the trend is going just the opposite. You know, all this new science, these new discoveries, this new technology is keeping people alive longer, which costs. You know, direct-to-consumer marketing. Why did Big Pharma increase their spend on direct-to-consumer advertising from about $11 billion in 1999 to $29 billion in 2005? It works. This is America. Are we going to say no to that? Free speech. Not a chance. Restriction of managed care practices. This is a... Uh, a slide, I, I was on the LeapFrog uh, Clinical Advisory Group for a number of years, and I stole this from, uh, from them. What it looks at is the rate of rise of, of health insurance premiums for the LeapFrog member organization. Everyone knows what LeapFrog is, right? You know, 150 plus of the largest companies in the country. Compared to inflation, here's the inflation line going along at 3 or 4% a year. Health insurance premiums. In the late 1980s, early 1990s, double-digit uh, rate of growth, way out of proportion to inflation, came down in 1995 to the lowest point of rate of rise, was there for a couple of years, and then started going back up. This was the, the heyday for managed care. At that time, I was on the board of a couple of managed care companies, and this was absolutely predictable. You know, why? And this indeed is one of the problems why private insurance has so much more difficulty controlling costs than one might think. This was an absolutely predictable outcome. This was when we were saying, no, you can't spend two or three days in the hospital if you deliver. You, have, you only have to spend one. Or no, you can't go see that consultant. You have to go to our consultant or any number of other things. What was the problem? Well, of what? Choice. I mean, this is a, in America, you know, we put choice at a very high value, much more than, than other countries. And this was an example where we simply, what was happening, despite how much sense it might have made and, and how effective it was at controlling costs, conflicted with the basic societal goal or value of choice. And what happened is, was actually uh, quite predictable. Well, just to continue down that, that list, 
you know, legislated health care service mandates. There are hundreds of these now. In California, where I am, the new law was just passed that said you have, the insurance companies have to cover autism. Uh, in a different lifetime, a long time ago, I was in, involved in uh, an effort to require companies to cover uh, reconstructive surgery after radical mastectomy. You know, which, and, and there are as I said, hundreds of these, all of which make great sense and are good for patients, but what do they do? Yeah, they drive costs up. Uh, we have the consolidation of hospitals, of healthcare groups that compete with each other, basically, on, so you can get better prices. The, the medical liability system that we continue to try to use a criminal justice approach to a highly technical and sensitive area that fundamentally doesn't work. We have, or America is what is uh, characterized by the uh, sociologists as having being a consumptive society. You know, basically, if a little bit of health care is good, then more must be better, and even more must be more better, and, you know, you can't get enough, even though, again, the evidence shows that that's exactly not the case. There's a certain amount that's good, and above that, it actually starts to be harmful. And then at last year, care variation from best practice, i.e. poor quality. So if you had to go down that list and say, okay, what can we actually do something about in the short term to control costs? you really come down to the last thing in the list, and that's improving quality, even though improving quality fundamentally is not a cost-saving strategy. But because of the extent and the amount of, of poor quality, there actually are significant savings to be achieved by uh, improving quality. Ergo, why so much attention uh, is focused on that as something that can be affected uh, in the short term. Well, I want to shift gears here and, and uh, make a point uh, Everyone understand here about mandatory and discretionary expenditures. You know, basically, the federal spending is divided into two buckets. The mandatory expenditures, which means they are caseload driven, and discretionary expenditures, which the Congress actually has to think about, insofar as that's something they can do, uh, to decide how much they're going to uh, spend on uh, an area. The mandatory expenditures are fundamentally are, are driven by three things, Social Security, Medicare, uh, and Medicaid, and interest on the national debt. Now, veterans' disability pensions are in there, but they are so small compared to others that they, they actually don't matter much. Now, veterans' health care is not in there, but those are the mandatory. Discretionary, national defense, international aid, housing, education, highways, arts, parks, you know, everything else is in the discretionary bucket. Historically, national defense consumes about 60% of discretionary expenditures. International aid is about 4%. It's been that way for, for decades. So here's a graphic that in the early 1960s, this is 1967, but we could backdate it a couple of years, mandatory expenditures accounted for about 30%, actually less than 30% of the federal budget. Discretionary expenditures were Two-thirds. It was a one-third, two-third ratio, basically. In 2007, that had reversed. So the mandatory expenditures now are two-thirds, discretionary about a third. Since then, we've had the recession. Medicaid expenditures are at record rates every year. We've had increase, our debt has increased because of the economic stimulus and, and other things, the uh, war in Southwest Asia, among other things. So th this actually uh, pattern has changed further, so to uh, shift more, and over the next several years, we'll shift more into the mandatory category, which confronts us with basically some macroeconomic realities, which is much of the debate going on in Washington, is that absent increased federal revenue, as mandatory expenditures increase, discretionary expenditures go down. I mean, it's, it's a fixed pie. In the current year that we're in, essentially all domestic discretion, all, all domestic programs that are funded with discretionary dollars accounted for less than 14% of the federal budget, which is a rather astounding figure, astoundingly small. That includes, you know, everything from highways and parks and education, infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera. Certainly the demand for building bridges that don't fall down, better highways, other sorts of things is growing where this pot is going down. 
which starts to, I think, make clear why there has to be substantial changes in the macroeconomic federal spending. You know, what does this mean? Well, the $500 billion that are being talked about as far as reducing uh, Medicare expenditures, that's just the, the down payment, probably. There's going to be major changes, and there have to be absent either increased revenues. What are revenues for the federal government? Taxes. To date, there isn't a huge line for the people who are saying pay more taxes. And there's also this recognition that health is about much more than health care. Indeed, from a population perspective, if you said, you know, what does health care contribute to the health of the population, depending on how you slice that population, it's somewhere around 10% to perhaps as much as 25%. You know, the cost benefit and the analysis of them that, you know, what's the health benefit of reducing class size in schools? And it actually compares very favorably to the best of healthcare things we can do. And then we get into things like housing and other things that, that you know, all of this again just sets the stage for why there's going to be major shakeouts in uh, healthcare spending uh, going forward. Well, let me just uh, continue here uh, much more quickly. The demand for greater accountability is uh, the second major current that's driving the uh, agenda these days. You know, payers want to know what they're paying for. All those employers, you know, managed care didn't work for them all the competitive contracting, other sorts of things, haven't been effective in reducing the price. They really want to know what they're paying for, and they want higher value. So the private payers, uh, as well as the government, is demanding more accountability. Consumers want more information in choosing providers. Again, some of the recent data that suggests about half of people are actually looking to the Internet and making at least some of their health care provider choices based on information that's provided about quality uh, of care. Uh, and that trend is certainly going up. What insurance they choose, as well as treatment. It's now very clear, perhaps mo most so in, in cancer uh, care, that what your genotype is and your individual uh, characteristics has a lot to do with which drugs work, how effective is that, that uh, care. And people are increasingly looking for that type of information. And across the board, consumers want more information. Certainly the regulators and, and the accreditors uh, are demanding more information. You know, policymakers uh, want more information so that they can make these difficult spending choices uh, going forward. You know, bottom line is, is health care has to become much more accountable, which means they have to have more information. They have to know both financially and, and uh, from a product point of view, i.e. quality of care, what they're doing much more so uh, than they have. And then finally, we have this, this problem of the health care supply uh, demand uh, mismatch where over the next decade, uh, it is reasonable to expect that there'll be at least a 20 to 25 percent increase in the demand for health care services. Part of this is being driven by the 32 million people who will have access to health care after 2014 through either Medicaid or state health insurance exchanges. Some of it's being driven by just the aging of the population and, and population growth and other things that, that we've talked about. But this increase and a pretty substantial demand for increased services is occurring at a time when we have widespread shortages of caregivers across the country. Depending where you are, the, the uh, specific numbers may uh, differ, but physicians uh, are in short supply and getting shorter, particularly in areas like primary care and behavioral health, geriatricians where the need is, is uh, growing perhaps most, nurses, clinical psychologists, uh, pharmacists, the, the imaging uh, or radiology technicians, physical therapists, informaticists, and you could keep going down the list. We have across the board shortages in healthcare personnel at the same time that the demand uh, is going up. We have lots of new technology coming down uh, the pike that's also going to uh, increase uh, demand uh, for services, and it, it's uh, across the board. And then, uh, again, just uh, given my, uh, what I do in my day job as far as looking at population health issues, I, I would be remiss if I didn't at least. Uh, these are just some headlines from recent articles 
about what's happening with the health of the uh, American population overall. I mean, a rather stunning statistic when 75% of Americans' youth who are at probably the, the most healthy point of their life uh, can't qualify for even the Army. Uh, now, it's not entirely for health reasons, but a large part of it is uh, health and, and particularly obesity. But education and other uh, problems disqualify them as well. Actually, life expectancy has started to decline uh, in many uh, or in a number of uh, segments of the population, which, again, from the payer's perspective, you know, if, if longevity and other metrics are going up, then you can kind of at least justify why you might be paying more. But when we're paying more and more, and yet the, the population metrics are uh, going south, it's a little bit hard to, uh, to justify some of that. And you can read it uh, as well. Bottom line is that there are, are serious threats to the overall uh, health and well-being of uh, the American uh, uh, public. So just the last couple of minutes, the Affordable Care Act, uh, you know, are we there? Is this the end of the, uh, the road? Is this uh, where things are going to stop? And I, hopefully I wouldn't have to uh, try too hard to convince you that you know, the Affordable Care Act is just one of what's likely to be a number of, of uh, measures that are trying to codify how we're going to manage these forces that are driving the change in health care. You, know, you, you often hear people say, well, the Affordable Care Act is a cause of all this. It's not the cause. You know, other things that we've mentioned are what's causing it. The Affordable Care Act is just was a political solution for how we deal with some of it. But it only dealt with part of it. It frankly doesn't do that much from a cost point of view. There's undoubtedly going to be more uh, dealing with cost issues going forward. But until you get a level playing field, particularly from an insurance point of view, you know, where m at least the overwhelming majority of the population is covered, then we can't seriously talk about some other things that, that have to uh, be done to actually deal with the, the larger issues. The uh, circling back to where I started, you know, the electronic health record is simply an essential navigational aid. You know, as I think others will uh, make comments later, it's not the solution, it's not the nirvana, it's an essential tool that's going to help you change practices to do other things that will, in fact, uh, address these dynamics. You know, I, I would liken the electronic health record in the early 21st century to what the stethoscope was uh, in the beginning of the 20th century. You know, it's, it's hard to imagine, but there was a point in time when the stethoscope really wasn't a very functional device, and, and towards the end of the uh, 19th century, early part of the uh, uh, 20th century, it, it actually became a tool that was very useful, and it really changed uh, uh, medicine in many ways. Uh, but again, it, that's what it was. It was a tool, whether you listen to the heart, the lungs, other uh, things, blood vessels. Uh, and the electronic health record is in many ways, a, there's an analogy there. It's a basic tool that has to be used. One has to uh, learn how to use it in different ways. It's really foundational, though, to how we address these issues of value, how we manage our resources, how we uh, become more accountable. It's the, the linchpin for how we start incorporating these other tele, uh, advanced uh, telecommunication, telecommunications technologies, whether it's telehealth, uh, whether it's use of social media, other things. The, the electronic health record is really the, the linchpin that will help bring all of those things together, which will then potentially actualize the notion of care being a continuous healing relationship as opposed to something based on uh, office visits. So circling back to uh, the uh, beginning, this is basically what we want to avoid uh, going forward, why we have to have electronic health records to uh, help us navigate down uh, these uh, turbulent waters. And I just want to close with uh, one other non-health care analogy. How many people here shopped at, bo at uh, uh, Borders? Okay. You know, I, I think what many people found uh, shocking uh, about the uh, bankruptcy of, of borders is that they were a market leader. They were a pioneer. Uh, they had actually changed the whole, uh, or, or one of the, the key entities that has changed the whole uh, retail business here. 
and were viewed for years as a market leader. And then the next thing you know, you're reading about him going bankrupt. You know, the, the question, and ironically, uh, you know, uh, Matthew Weinstock, you know, in, in uh, uh, hospitals and, and uh, health networks, uh, I think cap capitalized it very nicely. I mean, they fundamentally failed to adapt. The world changed. You know, things like Kindles and other things came along and fundamentally changed their business, and they were not quick enough at adapting. And there are many in healthcare who may have the, or at least at risk, of following the same pathway uh, unless they adapt and understand these currents that are changing uh, where we go forward. So with that, let me stop. We are close to being back on uh, time. I intentionally went through uh, a number of these things rather quickly to try to catch up on some time. If we have time, take uh, a question or two, or we'll move to uh, Bill. Yes? The question, would I comment about ACOs? Well, um, there's a lot I could say about ACOs. The one thing I would, just from a historical perspective, if you, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend that you do this, but, but if one were to read the uh, language that were in the documents that uh, were the foundation for changing the VA healthcare system in 1995, uh, setting up the VISNs, the Veterans Integrated Service Networks, and if you were to compare that language with what's in the Affordable Care Act and other things, you would find that they are strikingly similar. Uh, basically, the networks, the 22 and now 21 networks in the VA, are essentially accountable care organizations that have a 15-year uh, record on actually how you operationalize these things, although for various uh, political and other reasons, they've been largely left out of the conversation, but there's a wealth of information there. The other thing I would note that if you actually look at the payment model, where ACOs are going and some of the things that, uh, you know, how the VA is paid, you will also see that things start to look a, a lot more similar uh, than different. One or two other comments. You know, are ACOs the end of the game? I don't think so. They are a transition step, just like episode of care bundled payment is another uh, transition step to getting us to a global payment. Because frankly, the only way you're going to achieve many of those objectives or where those attributes of the 21st century healthcare system is by fundamentally changing the payment model where those things, uh, those attributes start to make sense. You know, if, if you, in a global payment model, having a continuous healing relationship becomes much easier because then you don't necessarily have to worry about the visits which get reimbursed but you get reimbursed for taking care of the patient. If you can do that over the internet, if they can get their drugs refilled, if they can get advice, if, you know, whatever. You know, if you talk to most primary care physicians, they would, uh, or at least uh, this has been a pretty consistent number, most of them would say 30 to 40 to perhaps as much as 50% of the patients who are in their offices every day don't need to be there. Their problems could be taken care of elsewhere. If you change the payment model so they don't need that office visit, then you can start doing that. You can then deal with personnel issues. You can deal with other sorts of things in a much more rational, cost-effective uh, manner. So, you know, I think the ACOs uh, are here. Uh, they'll be with us. I think they're a transition model. Uh, something else will follow that. They will morph uh, as things go forward. Uh, and, you know, remains to be seen. What I think is the important point is not to focus too much on the uh, specific details in, in you know the big picture, but what are the what's the intent? What's the purpose? What's the the goal of this model? And it's moving us to where you know in the, the next ten years or so, I would say payment uh, for healthcare will look very very different uh, in the United States than it does today. Thanks. Thank you.